Chapter Fifteen of Sylvie and Bruno. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Starr. Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. Chapter Fifteen. Bruno's Revenge. After that, we had a few minutes of silence while I sorted out the pebbles and amused myself with watching Bruno's plan of gardening. It was quite a new plan to me. He always measured each bed before he weeded it, as if he was afraid the weeding would make it shrink. And once, when it came out longer than he wished, he set to work to thump the mouse with his little fist, crying out, there now, it's all gone wrong again. Why don't oo keep oor tail straight when I tell oo? I tell you what I'll do, Bruno said in a half whisper as we worked. Oo like fairies, don't oo? Yes, I said. Of course I do, or I shouldn't have come here. I should have gone to some place where there are no fairies. Bruno laughed contemptuously. <laughs> Why, who might as well say, Oo'd go to some place where there wasn't any air. Suppose it oo did it like air. This was a rather difficult idea to grasp. I tried a change of subject. You're nearly the first fairy I ever saw. Have you ever seen any people besides me? Plenty said Bruno. We see em when we walk in the road. But uh, they cannot see you. How is it they never tread on you? Cannot tread on us, said Bruno, looking amused at my ignorance. Why, suppose we're walking here, so, making little marks on the ground. And suppose there's a fairy, that's me, Walking here, very well then, who put one foot here and one foot here, so who doesn't tread on the fairy? This was all very well as an explanation, but it didn't convince me. Why shouldn't I put one foot on the fairy? I asked. Hmm, I don't know why, the little fellow said in a thoughtful tone. But I know who wouldn't. Nobody never walked on the top of a fairy. <laughs> now I'll tell who what I'll do, as who is so fond of fairies. I'll get who an invitation to the fairy king's dinner party. I know one of the head waiters. I couldn't help laughing at this idea. Do the waiters invite the guests? I asked. Oh, not to sit down, Bruno said, but to wait at table. Oo'd like that, wouldn't it, oo? To hand about plates and so on? Well, but that's not so nice as sitting at the table, is it? Of course it isn't, Bruno said, in a tone as if he rather pitied my ignorance. But if oo are not even sir anything, oo cannot expect to be allowed to sit at the table, oo know. I said, as meekly as I could, that I didn't expect it, but it was the only way of going to a dinner party that I rarely enjoyed. And Bruno tossed his head and said in a rather offended tone that I might do as I pleased, there were many he knew who would give their ears to go. Have you ever been yourself, Bruno? They invited me once, last week, Bruno said very gravely. It was to wash up the soup plates, no, the cheese plates, I mean. That was grand enough. And I waited at table. And I didn't hardly make only one mistake. What was it, I said? You didn't mind telling me. Only bringing scissors to cut the beef with, Bruno said carelessly. 
But the grandest thing of all was, I fetched the king a glass of cider. That was grand, I said, biting my lip to keep myself from laughing. Wasn't it? said Bruno very earnestly. Oh, no, it isn't everyone that had such an honour as that. This set me to thinking of the various queer things we call an honour in this world, but which, after all, haven't a bit more honour in them than what Bruno enjoyed when he took the king a glass of cider. I don't know how long I might not have dreamed on in this way if Bruno hadn't suddenly roused me. Oh, come here, quick! he cried in a state of the wildest excitement. Catch hold of his other horn! I cannot hold him more than a minute! He was struggling desperately with a great snail, clinging to one of its horns and nearly breaking his poor little back in his efforts to drag it over a blade of grass. I saw we should have no more gardening if I let this sort of thing go on, so I quietly took the snail away and put it on a bank where he couldn't reach it. We'll hunt it afterwards, Bruno, I said, if you really want to catch it. But what's the use of it when you've got it? What's the use of a fox when oo've got it? said Bruno. I know oo big things hunt foxes. I tried to think of some good reason why big things should hunt foxes and he should not hunt snails, but none came into my head, so I said at last, Well, I suppose one's as good as the other. I'll go snail hunting myself some day. I should think oo wouldn't be so silly, said Bruno, as to go snail hunting by oorself. Why, oo'd never get the snail along if oo hadn't somebody to hold on to his other horn. Of course I shan't go alone, I said quite gravely. By the way, is that the best kind to hunt, or do you recommend the ones without shells? Oh, no, we never hunt the ones without shells, Bruno said with a little shudder at the thought of it. They're always so cross about it, and then if oo tumbles over them, they're ever so sticky. By this time we had nearly finished the garden. I had fetched some violets, and Bruno was just helping me to put in the last, when he suddenly stopped and said, I'm tired. Rest then, I said. I can go on without you quite well. Bruno needed no second invitation. He at once began arranging the dead mouse as a kind of sofa. And I'll sing oo a little song, he said as he rolled it about. Do, said I. I like songs very much. Which song will oo choose? Bruno said, as he dragged the mouse into a place where he could get a good view of me. Ting, ting, ting is the nicest. There was no resisting such a strong hint as this. However, I pretended to think about it for a moment, and then said, Well, I like ting, ting, ting best of all. That shows you're a good judge of music, Bruno said with a pleased look. How many harebells would you like? and he put his thumb into his mouth to help me to consider. As there was only one cluster of harebells within easy reach, I said very gravely that I thought one would do this time, and I picked it and gave it to him. Bruno ran his hand once or twice up and down the flowers, like a musician trying an instrument, producing a most delicious, delicate tinkling, as he did so. I had never heard flower music before. I don't think one can, unless one's in the airy state, and I don't know quite how to give you an idea of what it was like, except by saying that it sounded like a peal of bells a thousand miles off. When he had satisfied himself that the flowers were in tune, he seated himself on the dead mouse, 
he never seemed really comfortable anywhere else. And looking up at me with a merry twinkle in his eyes, he began. By the way, the tune was rather a curious one, and you might like to try it for yourself. So here are the notes. Rise, oh rise, the daylight dies, the owls are hooting, ding, ding, ding. Wake, awake, beside the lake, the elves are fluting, ding, ding, ding. Welcome in our fairy king, we sing, sing, sing. He sang the first four lines briskly and merrily, making the hare-bells chime in time with the music. But the last two he sang quite slowly and gently, and merely waved the flowers backwards and forwards. Then he left off to explain. The fairy king is Oberon, and he lives across the lake, and, and sometimes he comes in a little boat, and we go and meet him, and then we sing this song, you know. And then you go and dine with him, I said mischievously. Who shouldn't talk? Bruno hastily said. It interrupts the song so. I said I wouldn't do it again. I never talk myself when I'm singing, he went on very gravely. So who shouldn't either? Then he tuned the harebells once more and sang. Here, oh here, from far and near, the music stealing, ding, ding, ding. Very belts are down the dells, are merrily pealing, ding, ding, ding. Welcome in our fairy king, we ring, ring, ring. See, oh see, on every tree, what lamps are shining, ding, ding, ding. They are the eyes of fiery flies, to light our dining, ding, ding, ding. Welcome in a fairy king, they swing, swing, swing. Haste, oh haste, to take and taste, the dainties waiting, ting, 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 honey do is stored. Hush, Bruno, I interrupted in a warning whisper. She's coming. Bruno checked his song, and as she slowly made her way through the long grass, he suddenly rushed out headlong at her like a little bull, shouting, Look the other way! Look the other way! Uh, which way? Sylvie asked, in rather a frightened tone, as she looked round in all directions to see where the danger could be. That way, said Bruno, carefully turning her round with her face to the wood. Now walk backwards, walk gently, don't be frightened, who shall it trip? But Sylvie did trip notwithstanding. In fact, he led her, in his hurry, across so many little sticks and stones that it was really a wonder the poor child could keep on her feet at all. But he was far too much excited to think of what he was doing. I silently pointed out to Bruno the best place to lead her to, so as to get a view of the whole garden at once. It was a little rising ground, about the height of a potato, and when they had mounted it, I drew back into the shade that Sylvie mightn't see me. I heard Bruno cry out triumphantly, Now who may look? And then followed a clapping of hands, but it was all done by Bruno himself. Sylvie was silent. She only stood and gazed with her hands clasped together, and I was half afraid she didn't like it after all. Bruno, too, was watching her anxiously, 
And when she jumped down off the mound and began wandering up and down the little walks, he cautiously followed her about, evidently anxious that she should form her own opinion of it all without any hint from him. And when at last she drew a long breath and gave her verdict in a hurried whisper and without the slightest regard to grammar, "It's the loveliest thing as I never saw in all my life before." The little fellow looked as well pleased as if it had been given by all the judges and juries in England put together. And did you really do it all by yourself, Bruno? Said Sylvie. And all for me. I was helped a bit. <laughs> Bruno began with a merry little laugh at her surprise. We've been at it all the afternoon. I thought oo'd like. And here the poor little fellow's lip began to quiver, and all in a moment he burst out crying and running up to Sylvie. He flung his arms passionately round her neck and hid his face on her shoulder. There was a little quiver in Sylvie's voice too, as she whispered, "Why, what's the matter, darling?" And tried to lift up his head and kiss him. But Bruno only clung to her, sobbing, and wouldn't be comforted till he had confessed. I tried to spoil our garden first, but I'll never, never. And then came another burst of tears, which drowned the rest of the sentence. At last, he got out the words. I liked putting in the flowers for you, Sylvie, and I never was so happy before. And the rosy little face came up at last to be kissed, all wet with tears as it was. Sylvie was crying too by this time, and she said nothing but, "Bruno, dear," and, "I never was so happy before." Though why these two children, who had never been so happy before, should both be crying, was a mystery to me. I felt very happy too, but of course I didn't cry. Big things never do. You know we leave all that to the fairies. Only I think it must have been raining a little just then, for I found a drop or two on my cheeks. After that, they went through the whole garden again, flower by flower, as if it were a long sentence they were spelling out, with kisses for commas and a great hug by way of a full stop when they got to the end. Does you know that was my river edge, Sylvie? Bruno solemnly began. Sylvie laughed merrily. Oh, what do you mean? She said. And she pushed back her heavy brown hair with both hands and looked at him with dancing eyes, in which the big teardrops were still glittering. Bruno drew in a long breath and made up his mouth for a great effort. I mean, revenge, he said. Now, who understand? And he looked so happy and proud of having said the word right at last that I quite envied him. I rather think Sylvie didn't undertand at all, but she gave him a little kiss on each cheek, which seemed to do just as well. So they wandered off lovingly together, in among the buttercups, each with an arm twined round the other, whispering and laughing as they went, and never so much as once looked back at poor me. Yes, once, just before I quite lost sight of them. Bruno half turned his head and nodded me a saucy little goodbye over one shoulder, and that was all the thanks I got for my trouble. The very last thing I saw of them was this: Sylvie was stooping down with her arms round Bruno's neck and saying coaxingly in his ear, "Do you know, Bruno? I've quite forgotten that hard word. Do say it once more. Come, only this once, dear." But Bruno wouldn't try it again. End of chapter fifteen. Bruno's revenge.
Recording by John Starr. www.ourmanstar.com.